My name is Frank Sanders. I'm the head of the Telecommunications Theory Division at the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences, a laboratory of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, located in Boulder, Colorado. Over the past 30 years, we've developed a series of techniques for measuring emissions from various types of radio emitters. In particular, we've developed techniques for measuring emissions from radar transmitters. In this series of talks, I will begin by describing the fundamentals of RF measurement techniques, and I will culminate the series by describing our techniques for measuring emissions from radar systems, techniques that hopefully you can implement yourself. Accompanying this series of talks are notes available on our website and also NTIA reports that you may find useful. We hope that you will enjoy watching this series of videos as much as we've enjoyed producing them. Welcome to the 17th ITS RF Measurement Seminar. This is the last of the seminar talks that will talk about identifying and solving interference problems. And the title of today's talk is, in fact, Identification of Radar Emissions Affecting Geostationary Satellites. This has been a long-term problem, and it has gotten somewhat worse in recent years since the advent of sharing between radars and geostationary satellites at 14 gigahertz. So, what we're going to talk about is uh, the fact that radar signals can cause interference into satellite receivers, and we're going to examine, first of all, why radar transmitters can cause interference to Earth station and satellite links, and we're going to look at the three possible interference scenarios where unwanted radar emissions get directly into the satellites themselves, 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface, those are the uplinks, how unwanted radar emissions get into Earth stations on your service, the downlinks, and how desired radar emissions, the radar emissions on the assigned center frequencies of the radars, can cause overload of Earth stations, and again, those are the downlinks. Um, we're going to look at, briefly, radar emission characteristics for classical tube radars, for solid-state radars, and we're going to look at how radar antenna beam scanning works and how radar emission uh, spectrum characteristics appear. Now we've talked about a number of these features in previous talks in this series, so we're just going to do a quick review on these in this talk today. And then we'll finally really get down to business, which is how to measure radar emission parameters at Earth stations, since you can't ever normally get to a geostationary satellite to do measurements right there. And we'll look at the critical parameters that need to be measured to identify a radar emission in a satellite link, namely the pulse repetition rate, the pulse width, or sometimes just an estimation, the antenna beam scanning pattern, and then finally we'll look at how you can identify a particular radar type using the measurement data that you've already collected. So, first of all, why do radar transmitters cause problems to uh, Earth satellites? And it's not just geostationary satellites, although the problem tends to be worse with geostationary satellites, because they stay above one point on the Earth's surface long enough to get protracted interference from, uh, from satellites. Well, as we're going to see on the following slides, radar transmitters fundamentally cause interference into the satellite links due to a combination of geometry between the radars and the satellites and the satellite Earth stations, and also because of the high peak effective isotropic radiated power levels that radars put out. There are three mechanisms for interference from radars into satellite links, and I've al al already alluded to them briefly. Radar unwanted emissions that get directly into the satellite vehicles receivers, these are the satellites in orbit. Uh, being 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface is not enough distance to significantly mitigate this problem. The unwanted radar emission engine that gets directly into the Earth station receivers, and again, the radar desired emissions that can cause front end overload in the Earth station receivers on the Earth's surface. So, we've seen this graphic again in some previous uh, presentations in this series, so I'm not going to belabor it, but this is the problem where radar unwanted emissions, that is to say, the emissions 
in the receiver band for a satellite system, either the Earth Station downlink or the uplink, see energy from the radar, which is energy that the radar emitter is not trying to emit, but which is nevertheless present. And as indicated in this graphic, to the extent that radar emissions meet the radar spectrum engineering criteria limit set forth in the NTIA manual, the RSEC limit, this problem can be somewhat alleviated, although meeting the RSEC limit is not a guarantee that interference will not occur but it helps to prevent interference if radar emissions meet the RSEC limit. U.S. radar emissions need to meet that limit. The other problem is RF front-end overload, and again, we've been through this before, so we'll just briefly uh, recap this. Front-end overload occurs when a receiver system tuned to a certain frequency and which is supposed to operate in a certain band has a low noise amplifier at the front end of the receiver which responds with a high level of gain, here's the low noise amplifier gain, not just across the band that the receiver is trying to use but across a much wider frequency range since manufacturers don't see it as a problem to provide low noise amplifiers to receive across more than the specified frequency range and if in fact there is no bandpass filter in front of that low noise amplifier on that receiver so the bandpass filter i'm sorry so the low noise amplifier sees energy all the way across a large swath of spectrum then when a radar signal comes up at a frequency that's completely outside the receiver band and has emissions that are not even measurable in the receiver band nevertheless when that high power level comes on at this frequency which is within the response range of the low noise amplifier, the low noise amplifier responds by uh, losing gain, by having a reduced gain characteristic at frequencies all the way across its response range, including across the band where the receiver is trying to operate, and as a result, the receiver loses the gain on the desired signal that it's supposed to be seeing with a low noise amplifier, and it loses the desired signal altogether. And of course, band pass filters at the front end of the receiver are a must. Nevertheless, they're not always present. Now, geometry. The next piece of the puzzle is that a radar station on the Earth's surface, it could be a terrestrial station or it could be a station which is on a ship at sea or even an, a, a plane flying in the air, uh, has a beam that's shaped like this in cross-section if it's an air search radar. We've talked before about how aircraft down in here are not visible to the radar due to the curvature of the Earth's surface. And although a typical radar range limit for aeronautical search is 50 to 200 nautical miles out here, the energy continues to propagate out into space, and that energy will propagate out 22,000 miles away from the Earth's surface out to geostationary satellites. And air search beams are particularly prone, obviously, to this geometry. This also means that satellites won't typically see radar energy coming from the Earth's surface directly below the satellite at the nadir, but rather the satellites will see the radar energy coming from the limb of the Earth um, as seen from the vantage point of the satellite. So satellites see the Earth's rim as being hot with radio energy coming from radars, but they see the Earth's surface directly below the satellite as rather cold as far as radars are concerned, precisely because radars normally are not radiating straight up into space like that, wind profilers notwithstanding. Um, oh, back. Accidentally hit... Uh, now... Geometry is one problem. The other problem is the power level that's coupled into geosynchronous satellite uplinks at, right here we're looking at, the radar's center frequency, F0. The calculation is easy. We've done it earlier in the seminar series, so again, I, I, I won't belabor it. The power that's received by a satellite is equal to the transmitted power, P sub T, times the gain of the transmitter antenna, times 1 over 4 pi r squared, simple geometry, we'll assume free space loss, times the gain of the antenna of the satellite receiver. And so PT times GT is the effective isotropic rating power, so it's equal to EIRP times the gain of the receiver divided by 4 pi r squared. Now we can plug in some numbers. Typical EIRP from an air search radar peak is a gigawatt. And we know 1 over 4 pi r squared, because the satellites are 22,000 miles up, we'll do our calculation in meters. That's 3.5 times 10 to the 7 meters squared. What we get is 6.5 times 10 to the minus 5 milliwatts times the gain of the satellite receiver antenna in orbit. So let's assume that, that the satellite antenna has a mere 20 dB of gain. 
which is uh, in a decibels, which is a linear gain factor of 100. Well, that would mean that the, that the received power in the satellite's receiver from this one gigawatt air search radar on your service at 22,000 miles away, almost a tenth of the distance to the moon, is minus 22 dBm in, we'll say, a one megahertz bandwidth. We'll assume that the radar has a one microsecond pulse width. Minus 22 dBm. And we can continue this calculation right on down the line for 10, 20, and 30 dB antenna gains for the satellite versus 1 gigawatt, 100 megawatts, 10 megawatts, and 1 megawatt for the EIRP. And what we see is the power in a satellite receiver can range anywhere from maybe minus 62 dBm up to maybe minus 12 dBm. Any of those numbers at the radar's fundamental frequency are enough to easily cause interference to a satellite's operations. And while exact calculations re require particular knowledge of, the sat of a particular radar EIRP and particular satellite antenna gain factors, we see that, that if, if a satellite system were tuned into a radar band, you're going to have an inherent problem. And this has turned out to be a problem at 14 gigahertz, where, as I said, um, we have had in recent years a uh, reallocation of spectrum where satellites have begun to share spectrum with some radars at 14 gigahertz. Okay, so since the geometry of coupling from the radar beams to the satellites near stations is simply unavoidable, air search radars have to look up into the sky, satellites have to look down, and because interference can occur at the radar fundamental frequency, um, the uh, fundamental frequency energy from radars ought to be prevented in satellite bands. That is to say, spectrum sharing between radars and satellite systems is technically undesirable. Nevertheless, there are these cases where sometimes satellite center frequency emissions can occur in a satellite band. Now. As for radar unwanted emissions, they're lower in power than, than the energy at the radar's fundamental, but to mitigate or avoid problems with the unwanted emissions, as we saw, it's desirable that the NTIA RSEC or alternatively the ITUR uh, emission limit criteria be met by radar transmitters. And then finally, we'll consider the problem of uh, RF front end overload separately, but that type of interference can be mitigated only by modifying the Earth station receivers. Nothing can be done uh, to the radars to mitigate that problem. This problem can be, mitigate, can be mitigated by radars. This problem cannot. This problem can only be solved by putting a band pass filter on an Earth station receiver. I won't belabor the radar spectrum allocations except to say that uh, aside from 5 to 28 megahertz, which is HF, over the horizon backscatter radars, and I'm not aware of any problems that have occurred there with satellites, problems could occur due to any of these emissions. 42450, where you have the long range air search and space track radars and missions. 600 megahertz, not used by the U.S. administration, but by some foreign administrations. Radars and these bands, 900 megahertz, 1200 megahertz, 2729, 2931, 3137. These bands are all used by air search radars for air traffic control and air defense purposes. So these can always uh, present problems for satellites because they look out into the sky. 5250, 25, not quite as much of a problem, but still there are some long-range search and track radars that look out in the sky, meteorological radars look out there. Airborne radars in the 8.5 to 10.5 part of the spectrum. Uh, and then we have the 14 gigahertz uh, band, actually it's 13.75 to 14, where geostationary satellite uplinks are a potential problem. Um, in terms of interference effects uh, into radars uh, from non-radar systems, uh, this report 06-444 is useful. Um, generally speaking, as I said, intentional radar emissions do not occur in geostationary satellite bands. However, there have been cases where radars have been accidentally mistuned to frequencies outside their allocated bands. And I get about one to two calls a year about this uh, here at the lab in Boulder. And it turns out that there's been a radar accidentally tuned out of its band and is getting into a geostationary satellite band. High level unwanted emissions from radars, again, can, can be a problem. So, given that interference can occur into these geostationary satellite bands and that the topic today is identifying that, interfer that uh, interference and mitigating it, we need to review basically the two basic radar technologies because they have different emission characteristics and if we're trying to identify a radar from its emission characteristics we need to know what kinds of technologies uh, we may be looking at because the emissions are affected by the technologies. 
Basically, as we've talked about in some of the earlier types, uh, uh, talks. We have tube type radars that use magnetrons, klystrons, traveling wave tubes, etc. They've been around for half a century, but they're very popular. They put out a lot of power and they're relatively inexpensive, typically. Then there are the solid state radars. These are newer radar d designs. They have become very popular in the last 20 years. They offer advantages in cost and maintainability, but they are heavier than tube radars. They actually can only develop one tenth, typically, one tenth as much peak power as tube radars, and so they do have drawbacks compared to tube type radars. Suffice to say, both types are out here. So in the following nine slides, we'll briefly review the particular characteristics of tube type and solid state radars. First of all, common radar types at a glance. Long range air search radar. We've got a big, uh, 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 coast, one over cosecant squared antenna rotating in here every 10 to 12 seconds. Here's a space surveillance radar, a 10-story tall building with a phased array uh, set of uh, cross dipole elements on its surface. Is that pave pause? Uh... That is a pave pause radar. That is the FPS 115 slash 123V, and uh, the U.S. has a number of these radars. Foreign countries have a number of these. Yes. Is that the sister to the uh, pave pause? I mean, the uh, Cobra Dane in Alaska? Yes. Or... Very, very similar technology. Different radar band. Okay. Different, different emission band, but similar technology. Okay. Exactly. And obviously, these are looking up into the sky. Mm -hmm. We have here maritime surface search and navigation radars. These are slotted array antennas spinning around every two to four seconds, uh, mounted on uh, uh, ships and uh, boats at sea. Here we have an airborne radar uh, with a um, uh, parabolic reflector antenna, sector scanning from side to side. We have a tactical long-range L-band air search radar here, again, rotating around every 12 seconds or so, but while it's rotating every 12 seconds, it's got a beam that's being scanned electronically in ele elevation like this, broop, 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 while it's rotating. Of course, it does that at high speed, so it, it develops three-dimensional information. A uh, radar plan position indicator, uh, this is for an analog radar. Digital radars reproduce this kind of display, they just do it through digital programming. A medium range air traffic control radar with a beacon on top, and again we've talked about these in previous talks, so that's just a very quick uh, re-survey. So radar uh, mission characteristics, for every one of those types of radars, we have a set of mission characteristics that we can always use to, to basically ident identify them. One is how fast, what's the repetition rate at which pulses are coming out of the radar. So pulse repetition rates or inversely the intervals between pulses. The widths of the pulses, the pulse widths. The beam scanning intervals and characteristics. Every one of those radar types I showed you has its own unique beam scanning interval and beam scanning characteristic. And finally emission spectrum characteristics. The pulse repetition rates, or intervals, can be measured directly and easily in a satellite link, typically at the satellite Earth station. The pulse widths can be measured directly, or they can be at least estimated. You can measure them directly with some spectrum analyzers and with oscilloscopes. You can at least estimate them with any spectrum analyzer. We'll talk more about that. Antenna beam scanning intervals can be measured directly. That's, that's dead simple. Very, very easy if you know how to do it. And spectrum measurements aren't always feasible in all cases, but, they, but looking at the emission spectrum can help you distinguish between radar types. And that's what it all comes down to, is if you can get measurements on these characteristics at an Earth station, then you will be able to uh, come a lot closer and, and hopefully come dead on to identifying the particular radar type that's getting into your uh, communication system, the satellite links. So the pulse characteristics of classical or tube type radars. Basically, tube type radars typically emit pulses that are on the order of 1, 3, or 10 microseconds, but they're on the order of a microsecond. The interval between them is roughly a thousand times longer, one millisecond. If you see that kind of duty cycle, a duty cycle of 0.1%, that is to say the pulse width divided by the interval between the pulses is about a tenth of a percent or so, it's almost certainly a tube radar. And this is because tube radars can develop extremely high power and they uh, can then listen for a protracted interval between the pulses before they fire the next pulse. Again, we've talked about this in, in uh, previous talks. Bear in mind that these radars have to put about 15 to 20 transmitted pulses on a target in order to get 15 to 20 echoes back, and you need 15 to 20 echoes back to integrate the power from or in an echo enough to see 
the energy reflected off a target at 150 or 200 nautical miles with an air search radar just high enough to get through your detection threshold in the radar receiver and be able to just barely be able to pick it up. This means that when you're looking at a radar, you're going to see 15 to 20 pulses at a time every time the beam scans past you. That's important because if you if you see 15 to 20 pulses of any sort in a geostationary satellite link when the interference bursts occur, it's pretty much certain that that's a radar doing it. Um, now, as for the solid state radars, again, we've talked about this before, so I won't belabor it, but because they can only put out one-tenth, typically, of the power of a tube-type radar, they have to run pulses that are ten times longer to get the same total amount of energy in the pulse, and they have to get the same amount of energy in the pulse as the tube-type radar in order to get a strong enough echo back to process it, but this means that they lose range resolution if they don't put any modulation into that pulse, again, as we've discussed previously. So what they have to do is modulate the pulse by, for example, changing the frequency of the pulse while the pulse itself is running. So if we have a 10 microsecond long radar pulse, while the pulse is running, the frequency may be increased, or, or, or conversely, the frequency could be decreased. It doesn't even have to be linear. It could do a nonlinear change of frequency with time. But in any event, they have to put modulation to the pulse so that in the receiver, they can use processing to recover the range resolution, which is a function of the effective pulse width. I think, is this pulse compression? So this is a pulse compression technique. This is called chirping. They actually sound like a chirp, if you listen to them. Or they can modulate, if not frequency, they can modulate phase. They can switch between zero and pi while the pulse is running. Again, we've talked about this in earlier talks, so I won't belabor it. But here we have 13 phase chips. Each chip is either pi or zero for its phase. These equivalently, in terms of logic, are ones and zeros. A, a set of 13 of these is a so-called Barker code, very popular in radars. You can actually see the phase transitions occur even if you're looking at this with a spectrum analyzer that normally doesn't see phase, because you'll actually see little little dips, little dips occur. And if you see uh, 10 or 12 or 13 of those little dips occurring in the envelope of a pulse with a with a spectrum analyzer or with a detector on an oscilloscope, you know that you're looking at a, at a Barker. Uh, coded pulse of some sort. Clearly the chips are down. Right? The chips are down. A nut, yes. Another one is if you see a pulse width in microseconds that divides evenly by 13, for example, if you see a 52 microsecond long pulse and you say, 52 microseconds, two things. That's a long pulse, a lot longer than one microsecond, and the second is why 52 microseconds? Why would, that's such a strange number, why not pick 50? And then you say, oh, 52 is 4 times 13. Ah, they're Barker coding. Right there you know it. So, typical pulse characteristics listed with pulse width and pulse repetition interval as a function of radar type. If it's a maritime surface search radar, you're going to be seeing 50 to 300 nanosecond pulse widths. The time between the pulses will be at about a tenth of a microsecond, about a hundred, I'm a tenth of a millisecond, about a hundred microseconds, because they're working a short range. Short range air search, you're looking at more like a microsecond uh, pulse width and a, and a millisecond between the pulses. Classic for a 80 to 150 nautical mile air search radar, air traffic control radar. Long range air search, 150 to 200 nautical miles. The pulses get longer, 3 to 10 microseconds because they're not so worried about range resolution at the long ranges. But the interval between them has to get longer, 3 milliseconds, because they're working 2 to 3 times longer range than the short range air searches. And they have to wait, as we know, for the, for the pulses to go all the way out to a target, hit the target, come back, before they fire the next pulse. And that's how long it takes, 3 milliseconds. Now, radars on aircraft, airborne search and track. A lot of variation here. 0.05 microseconds to a microsecond because these are multi-mode, multi-function, multi-purpose radars. They'll transmit different pulses uh, for different uh, missions and purposes. And one radar may mix the pulses all together because it may be multi-moding uh, while it's flying. Anywhere from, a, from 0.1 to 1 millisecond. One good thing about airborne uh, radars, they don't get into earth stations or satellites for long before the aircraft moves enough or turns, changes its azimuth enough to get its beam away from the satellite or the earth station. Airborne mapping, 1 to 10 microseconds, 0.1 to 0.3 millisecond pulse repetition interval. Now, for the solid state radars, you've got the same pulse repetition intervals as for the tube type radars because they've still got to wait long enough for the pulses to go out from the radar, hit a target, and echo back before they fire the next pulse, but the pulse widths are typically 10 times or more longer because they can't reach the high power levels. So when you see these kinds of pulse widths, 
Now you're looking at probably a solid state radar. This may give you a clue later when you're trying to figure out what kind of radar is causing the interference. Now the radar beam scanning characteristics. For a maritime surface search radar, it's going to spin around mechanically every two to four seconds, and it's got a beam width which is a fan beam. It's narrow in azimuth, but it's broad in elevation. The good news about these is they don't often get in satellite links because they're tipped a little bit below horizontal down to the ocean surface. But if you did see a radar spinning around every two to four seconds, you're probably looking at a uh, maritime surface search radar. Um, these do operate, by the way, both at X-band in the 8.5 to 10.5 uh, gigahertz part of the spectrum and also at 3 gigahertz. And so those are two prime, um, uh, 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 well, if you see interference adjacent to those bands, uh, this is a prime ra radar type to look at. Short range air traffic control, typically mechanical rotation. They're two-dimensional radars. We've talked about this before. They don't get the elevation information, but they do get azimuth information. You'll see them coming around every five seconds. If, it, if, it's, if it's a U.S. air traffic control radar, short-range air traffic control, it'll be 4.75 seconds. Other short-range uh, air search radars may combine mechanical rotation with the electronic elevation scanning that I mentioned earlier. So now you see a repetitive characteristic, and because um, these are uh, uh, having to scan three dimensions. They have to slow down the scan rate. They're going to come around every 10 or 12 seconds. But now you're going to see not a simple repetition every, every 10 or 12 seconds, but a simple repetition with another time varying characteristic overlaid on it. We'll, we'll see a diagram in a minute. Um, due to the electronic elevation scanning like this that's going on while the regular rotation is occurring. Long range air traffic control. Typically, plain vanilla mechanical rotation, 10 to 12 seconds, nothing complicated going on in there. Again, we'll see a picture of that in a second. Other long-range air search, you can combine mechanical rotation with electronic elevation scanning, um, and uh, actually, that is simply a, a re repetition of that line. Sorry about that. Phased array air search. Now we have fully electronic scanning. What's happening here is, the beam is being moved on what looks like a random basis in space. It's not, it's not random from the standpoint of the radar operation, but from the standpoint of someone away from the radar, it, it looks like a random movement in space. Um, but here's, here's the thing to know. Any radar scanning the air around it, scanning space around it, has to come back to any given location in space every 5 to 12 seconds lest they miss a target, lest they miss a target. So it'll be a more irregular characteristic or pattern that you'll see, but if you watch it for a couple of minutes, you're going to see that nevertheless, on the average, every 5 to 12 seconds, you get a really high amplitude hit. That means that they've designed it so that no matter how kind of erratically the electronic beam scanning looks to you at a distance, and Bob, this goes back to the pave pause phased array, for example, mm -hmm. or the Navy's Aegis radar, Every 5 to 12 seconds, it's roughly, it's going to come back because they don't want to miss a target for more than 5 to 12 seconds when they're looking. Mm -hmm. Airborne search and track, they do the sector scanning. Remember, sector scanning is this. Back and forth. Now, let's suppose that you happen to be located over here, and there's an airborne radar doing sector scanning, and you're seeing that sector scanning, and you're listening to it every time it comes through. Here's what you're going to hear. Boop. Boop. Boop, boop. Boop, boop. So you get two shorts and a long, two shorts and a long, two shorts and a long. You get one you get one hit here, boop. Another hit here, boop. And then a long, it goes all the way over here and then comes back. So now you're not going to get a regular repetition every two or four or five or ten seconds. Two shorts and long together, you're off to the side of the of the sector scanning. If you're in the middle of the sector scan, it'll look like rotation. Boop. But how often are you going to be dead center in a sector scan on an airborne radar? Not very often. And then the airplane's going to turn, and then you'll get the boop boop characteristic. And then finally, airborne mapping again, you'll see a kind of a sector scan characteristic on that. Radar emission spectrum characteristics. Uh, it's a little hard to read here, but we're looking at frequencies here 
from uh, 2500 to 3100 megahertz. 400 megahertz of spectrum, it's a magnetron radar. These are the unwanted emissions. It meets the RSEC limit, but the unwanted emissions are measurable. They can cause problems. Another radar that comes closer to uh, the RSEC limit, again, this is 200 megahertz per um, every pair of divisions. So we're seeing this across one, two, three, four, five, six, eight hundred megahertz of spectrum. Look, we can see the unwanted emissions across eight hundred megahertz of spectrum. So if you're sitting over here in the spectrum uh, and it meets the RSEC limit, you've still got measurable energy. And I won't belabor the structure. We've seen this before, so we'll just quickly snap through this. We have the classical sine over x squared spectrum here in the center. We have the out-of-band emissions. We have the unwanted emissions. and, and uh, I'm sorry, we have the out-of-band spurious emissions, which, which together are called unwanted emissions. And um, it's those out-of-band spurious emissions that can cause the problem. And typical RSEC limits are a 40 dB down, followed by a gradual drop down to 60 dB. But again, just because you meet the RSEC doesn't mean that you can't cause interference. Okay, so how do we measure the radar's characteristics? Well, that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, if you're, if you're going to measure the radar characteristics in, in an earth station link, you're going to have to, first of all, get access into the earth station. Secondly, you've got to get access to the IF stage output of the receiver. Then you're going to need to have, or not then, but you will need to have, when you get to the earth station, your spectrum analyzer for sure. Optionally, it's good to have, if you can get it, an oscilloscope and a crystal type, that is to say a discrete component, one that you can put in your hand, detector. Like, for example, an Agilent, previously Hewlett Packard 8474B, but there are lots of discrete component detectors you can use. If you think you're getting um, uh, RF front end overload at the Earth station, then you'll also probably eventually need to get access to the antenna or the dish where there'll be an LNA or an LNB installed. So, to get the pulse repetition interval and the pulse width, here's what you do. First of all, connect the spectrum analyzer to the IF stage output. Second, tune the spectrum analyzer uh, frequency span to match the earth station IF frequency range. So if the earth station, for example, is 30 megahertz wide at the IF, you want to set up your spectrum analyzer to look at the entire 30 megahertz of that earth station IF. Then set the spectrum analyzer resolution bandwidth, also called the IF bandwidth, to at least a megahertz. Wider if you can get it, but at least a megahertz. Don't, don't tune it to less than a megahertz. Set the video bandwidth of the spectrum analyzer to be greater than or equal to the resolution bandwidth of the spectrum analyzer. The shorthand here is video bandwidth greater than or equal to the resolution bandwidth. Set the spectrum analyzer input RF attenuation to a value that lets you, you, see the satellite receiver IF noise at least 10 dB above the spectrum analyzer noise. So when you hook up that spectrum analyzer, you want to see the noise level jump when you hook it to the IF. That's what, one of the reasons that you want to set the RF attenuation usually to about zero. Because when we see noise, we want it to be the receiver's noise that's getting the interference, not the spectrum analyzer's noise. And then the detection mode of the spectrum analyzer should be set to positive peak so we can see these short radar pulses and set the screen trace refresh mode to clear right so it keeps changing itself every time it runs a sweep. And then go for a 20 or 50 millisecond. It's not critical, but 20 milliseconds, 50 millisecond sweep time on the analyzer just for starters. Now, watch the analyzer display until the interference occurs. Hopefully it occurs fairly frequently or you can coordinate this so that you don't have to sit there too long waiting for it. Go to a single sweep trace uh, on the analyzer and capture that. And you might have to use video triggering on the spectrum analyzer to do it. Otherwise you might have to catch one of them kind of manually on the fly. Use your ingenuity. You'll figure it out. Change the trace mode now to maximum hold. Now, that's not the same as positive peak. You're already using positive peak detection, but the trace mode needs to be max hold where you're remembering the highest power level that any bin on the, on the spectrum analyzer display has ever seen. Keep the detection mode just set to positive peak. Let the envelope now of the interference across the, satellite's I, the satellite receiver's IF fill itself in. You'll have to wait for maybe a minute, maybe a few minutes, but it'll fill itself in pretty quickly. Now, capture that max hold envelope, that is, record that trace after it fills in. Now, set the spectrum analyzer trace mode to clear right, and repeat steps 8 through 11, the single trace, the max hold envelope, fill itself in, um, and then capture. Repeat that for other bandwidths. 
try to do it for bands of 3 megahertz, 1 megahertz, 300 kilohertz, and 100 kilohertz. You want to get a picture of what this interference looks like in hopefully three or four different bandwidths. Leave the video bandwidth on its widest setting that you can get. Keep it greater than or equal to the resolution bandwidth. You're looking for the radar pulses, so you need to keep that video bandwidth wide. At this point, what you've done is recorded a bunch of data that is going to tell you the pulse rep rate and the pulse width. Now, you're probably saying, but wait a minute, I just did a spectrum scan. How am I going to get time domain data out of frequency domain spectrum analyzer traces? Glad you asked. The answer is the pulse rep rate is going to be reviewed, uh, revealed by virtue of the fact that the analyzer's frequency domain clear right traces are nevertheless displayed over a period of time. It takes the analyzer time to make a frequency dis dependent um, display. Pulse width is going to be estimated using mass filter theory on the Maxwell screen captures. I'll explain that a little more in a minute. So, what's really happened is the pulse repetition sequence has been recorded in time while the radar pulses are going boop, 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 a millisecond apart. They were being recorded in time while the, while the spectrum analyzer was sweeping frequencies across the IF. It's sweeping frequencies across the IF, but while sweeping the frequencies like this, the pulses are going boop, 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 in time, a millisecond or a few milliseconds apart. The result being that you're going to see the time domain behavior of the radar on the frequency domain display of the spectrum analyzer. And then, um, I'll show you a graph in a minute, but for the pulse width, what, what you're going to take advantage of is the fact that the pulse width is roughly equal to the inverse of whichever bandwidth yielded the first max hold envelope that had a little lower amplitude than all the other max hold envelopes. I'll explain, again, I'll explain that more in a second. It, it looks confusing. It, it is simpler than it sounds. It, it's, it's easier, I think, to see it in pictures than to go with the words. Now, these are displays taken from an actual Earth station which was recording interference from an actual radar into an actual geostationary satellite. This is not a simulation. What we've done here is measure frequency relative to the band edge of a radar band. So the edge of the, of the radar band is right here. This radar, as it turns out, had been mistuned and had been tuned up into the satellite band. And so we get this frequency domain display here that goes across uh, that goes across um, uh, about 18 megahertz worth of spectrum. So, so we get power in arbitrary dB across here. We, they used peak detection. Video bandwidth was greater than or equal to resolution bandwidth. Megahertz was the resolution bandwidth and so forth. And this is one sweep across and I've colored this in. So in that one sweep we saw blip, 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 blip right on across here. Now what people usually do is they say, oh, so it's frequency hopping. Look, it's on all these different frequencies. No, it is not on different frequencies. It's running on one frequency. One tuned frequency. It's not frequency hopping. What we're seeing here is the time characteristic of this radar. What we see if we count these up is we got 10 blips across here. A couple of them were a little on the low side, but we got 10 blips across here. Remember I said radar needs 15 or 20. It can even be as low as 10. 10, 15, 20 pulses to reliably detect target. We just saw 10 blips. Mmm, that's a little suspicious. And we would see this repeated every single time that we would look at this receiver IF when this interference would occur. And if this radar were rotating every, let's say, 10 seconds, how often would we get this set of blips? Every 10 seconds. You're going to get a set of blips like this every 10 seconds, or every 5, or every 4. That's every time the radar comes around and looks. And somebody looks at this and says, oh, oh, look, 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 it's frequency hopping, and look, I can measure it. It's 1.2 megahertz between the frequencies. No, no, no. A radar, first of all, wouldn't have 1.2 megahertz between the frequencies. It would be more than that, but no. What's happening is the sweep time on the spectrum analyzer was 10 milliseconds. In that 10 milliseconds, we had 10 blips occur, and if we measure that off in time, it's 0.8 milliseconds, 800 microseconds, that occurred between these, between these blips. And these blips are the separate pulses that the radar is putting out in time. So we don't use the frequency domain display. We don't say they're 1.2 megahertz apart. They're not 1.2 megahertz apart. They're all emitted on the same frequency. What happened was they're emitted on one frequency, and they were emitted 800 microseconds, 0.8 milliseconds apart, but if we now fill this in with that maximum hold mode for the spectrum analyzer, that's what they got. 
Ah, now it becomes clear. The envelope of the spectrum looks like that. This might even be a magnetron radar. Look at that. See? That's that classic magnetron hump a little bit below the fundamental. But the, but the blips that make this up, these are the time domain pulse emissions coming out. Get it? That's the tricky part. This has confused more people more times over the years than I could tell you. So, now, we know how to measure the pulse rep rate with a spectrum analyzer. Now, the measurement of the pulse width. What we take advantage here of here is the fact that as we increase the bandwidth that you, we're using to measure a pulse signal with a peak detector, the power that we measure will go up as 20 log of our bandwidth until our bandwidth is greater than or equal to 1 over the pulse width. And once our bandwidth is greater than or equal to 1 over the pulse width, then the power that we measure in the pulse emission doesn't go up anymore at all. And, and again, this is, these are actual data points graphed from a maritime surface search radar where we measured it with a set of bandwidths running from 300 kilohertz, right here, to 1 megahertz, to 3 megahertz, to 8 megahertz. And when we measured its power with a peak detector in each of those bandwidths, what we saw was the fo were the following power levels graphed on this axis. If we measure the slope of this graph, the slope of this graph is 20 log of the bandwidth. And this is when the thing was running in a short pulse mode. The radar was running in a short pulse mode. And so what we're seeing here is that at, at 8 megahertz, and the inverse of 8 megahertz is 125 nanoseconds, the power we were measuring was still going up. So we know that this pulse width of this radar is less than or equal to 125 nanoseconds. Um, and the oscilloscope measurement later showed that it was actually 80, 80 nanoseconds. That was its short pulse mode. So here, all we could tell you is it's, it's less than or equal to 125 nanoseconds because it's just going on off up here. But in the long pulse mode, we measured this power in 300 kilohertz, this power in 1 megahertz, this power in 3 megahertz, and this power in 8 megahertz. All we do is connect, is connect the dots with a line going up this way, and we get a, line, a flat line going across like that, and where those two lines meet, we drop down vertically to this point. We, we take that bandwidth where the two lines cross. We take one over that bandwidth, and we get 800 nanoseconds. That's its pulse width. Never had to touch an oscilloscope. We could touch an oscilloscope, but why do that? when you've got a um, spectrum analyzer handy. So, the, the math equation that you can use is that, uh, that um, the uh, power that we're measuring in a, in a, in a bandwidth, B sub mass, a measurement bandwidth, um, is can be used to get the pulse width when we get to a measurement bandwidth where we turn that corner, here's where, here's where we turn the corner in here, uh, or less. We can also get it down here, and what we do is we take whatever that maximum power level is that we measure in some bandwidth. Go back, sorry, go backward. Here's P max. That's the max power. Any bandwidth we use equal to or greater than that point, we get P max. We then measure, or we take the power measured in any of these bandwidths. That bandwidth is good. That bandwidth is good. A bandwidth there would be good. A bandwidth down here would be good. Use the power measured in any of these bandwidths, B mass, and compare it to the power that you measured maxed out over here. So there's P mass minus P max in decibels. Take the difference, divide by 20, take 10 to that power, and then multiply by 1 over that measurement bandwidth that's down here. Say it's that bandwidth right there, 300 kilohertz. So at 300 kilohertz we measure some power level which is, do, 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 oh I don't know, oh 13 dBm versus max power 22 dBm. 300 kilohertz, 22 dBm, 13 dBm. Remember those numbers. So I take, so I take uh, 13 dBm minus 22 dBm is 9 dB. Divide it by 20. Take 10 to that power, and then multiply that by 1 over 3 kilohertz, 300 kilohertz, and that's your pulse width. Simple as that. And I've got a little worked example down here. Beautiful. You can always go back and use my worked example. And you see, I've got a problem. Max power. Blah blah blah. And there you go, 1.2 microseconds, read off for some arbitrary 
problem. Now these are some example data sets, so you can, you can stop the recording at this point and write down all the numbers. I'm not going to belabor it. But you get a radar show spikes that seem to be 2 megahertz apart on the frequency dis display, which is itself 20 megahertz wide, is recorded with a swoop time of 25 milliseconds. You measured minus 20 dBm in bandwidths of 3 megahertz and 1 megahertz, but when you went down to smaller bandwidths, you measured, um, for example, uh, 1.5 well, the measured power dropped by dropped. The measured power dropped by 1.5 dB when you went to 300 kilohertz. So, what are the characteristics? Well, the PRI has to be, and we do the math here, 2.5 milliseconds. So, the pulse repetition rate is 400 pulses per second. What's that? Long range radar. Got to be pulse width 2.8 microseconds. Long range radar. Duty cycle. Divide the pulse width by the pulse repetition interval. You get 0.11 percent. Is it a tube or a solid state? Tube type radar. Bingo. Oh, and by the way, there's a bonus. We can take the speed of light times the pulse repetition interval, divide by two, because we're, we're, we're going to compute the amount of time and therefore the distance that's elapsed between the time that one pulse is fired out, hits a target, comes back to the time the next pulse is emitted. So we take the pulse repetition interval, multiply it by the speed of light, divide by two, we do the math right here, 375 kilometers, 230 nautical miles. Ha! It's a tube type radar with a 230 nautical mile range, pulse width of 2.8 microseconds, and the pulse rep rate of 400 pulses per second. We got all of that from basically one or two spectrum analyzer displays. Amazing. More work examples, I won't belabor them here, except uh, again to say that you can always stop this on the tape and you can go on the DVD and go back and look at it. But uh, characteristic where we get a 0.27 millisecond interval between pulses, that's 3,700 pulses per second. 210 nanoseconds is the pulse rep interval, clearly a short range radar. Duty cycle, 0.08%, again tube type. What's this maximum range? 25 miles. What do you think? Terrestrial air search? No. How about airborne? Ah, might be. Airborne, guy flying an airplane, wants to know who's 25 miles out there in front of him? Yep. And, and that won't be a commercial airliner. If they're looking for a target, it's military. If, they're looking, if, a, if a pilot's looking for another airplane with a radar, he's, he's not flying into LaGuardia. He's uh, <laughs> got other things in mind. Would so, this be a military radar? Here? Almost for sure. Okay. Or else a maritime service search in there, you might want to... What about the weather radars they have on air? Ah, weather radars look out to long ranges. Uh, okay. They might have a 25-mile mode, but they're usually looking further out. Really? Yeah, on the commercial airliners, they are, right? Yeah. Exactly. Now, pul same pulse repetition interval as before, um, but uh, the uh, drop in power uh, on the spectrum envelope, envelope didn't occur until we got down to 10 kilohertz bandwidth before we got that power dropping off, before we turned the corner on that graph. So what's going on with that radar? Well, again, we just do the math, literally. Pulse width is 100 microseconds, but the pulse repetition interval is, is this 2.27 milliseconds we had from the previous, previous example. What's the duty cycle? 37%? Not tube type. Not consistent with tube type. Probably solid state. Therefore, probably chirped or phase coded pulses. And if you look at it with a vector signal analyzer, I bet you 50 bucks. I bet you more than that. <laughs> but the max range is still the same. So, you can measure pulse widths and pulse rep rates directly on a spectrum analyzer display uh, in a zero hertz span mode. In other words, just stay on one frequency. Um, if the machine has adequate time resolution capability. Um, a lot of the newer machines do. A lot of the newer machines can go down to a few microsecond sweep time. Older spectrum analyzers are often limited to about a 20 millisecond sweep time, which isn't enough to really resolve everything. Is that the 8566 theory? For, for example, yes, exactly. So, depending upon the circumstances with your spectrum analyzer in a zero hertz span, if it can't sweep fast enough or you want to really get some detailed looks, Use an oscilloscope with a crystal detector on the IF output, like for example an Agilent 8474, and, um, and then you can measure the pulse width directly on the oscilloscope, and um, you can also obviously measure the pulse repetition, rep, pulse repetition interval that way. Try to get enough radar power in there to get into the square law response region of the detector, although it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, it's not a bad thing, though, to get the, that, that peak pulse power out of the radar up to minus 30, 30 dBm if you're using a detector. You don't have to, but it's good. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, I'll bear in mind that radar pulses are rarely less than 10 nanoseconds, but if a pulse width were 10 nanoseconds, one over the pulse width would be 100 megahertz. You're probably not going to have a 100 megahertz bandwidth on a spectrum analyzer. In fact, I know you won't. And you may have a hard time getting that 
uh, on, a, on a, um, oscilloscope, although the detector will have that much bandwidth, the, the scope might or might not. So there may be some cases where you're limited by the bandwidth of either your scope or your spectrum analyzer, in which case you just have to say that the pulse width is less than or equal to some number, but that's all you can say. Some of the new, you know, high-end scopes are, you know... True. Some of them can go to 150 megahertz, for example, or you can get to uh, high-speed digital sampling scopes to go faster, but bear one thing in mind. Sometimes those wide bandwidths on some oscilloscopes are not in single shot mode. Some of them, not all, some of them rely on repetitive sampling from one scope sweep to the next. And if that's the case, it's not going to work well or at all with a radar pulse where you've got to have single shot mode 100 megahertz bandwidth if you're going to see a 10 nanosecond pulse width. But I'm glad you brought that up, Bob, because yeah, yeah it's worth knowing. I mean, you know, for instance, Tektronics, uh, they'll have, they have a 12 gigahertz real time scope where you right. that full bandwidth. Right. The uh, problem is it costs you $100,000. It costs $100,000. And yeah. again, I, and I don't know if they do or don't, but do they do they do that in single shot mode on yes. one? Oh, they do. Yeah. Okay. Well, great then. But okay. you, you pay the penalty in vertical resolution. Ah, okay. But for this purpose, you wouldn't care. I mean, yeah. Okay. So good. Okay. Now, next piece of the puzzle: the antenna beam scanning characteristics. How does this thing scan a beam through space in time? Well, here are the steps for it: connect the analyzer. Uh, to the I stage output again, clear right trace mode on the analyzer, positive peak detection because we're looking for short little pulses, and whatever the, the RF attenuation was that you were using before, use it again. Probably zero on the spectrum analyzer, but maybe 10 dB. Set the resolution bandwidth as close as you can to one over the pulse width of the radar because we want to get um, a good dynamic range in the measurement. Matched filter theory says that if the resolution bandwidth of the analyzer equals one of the pulse width, we get maximum dyna maximum possible dynamic range on our measurement. And make sure the video bandwidth is greater than or equal to the resolution bandwidth. Um, tune the analyzer uh, center frequency to the center fre frequency of the radar as read in the IF. There is a down conversion. So th that'll be obvious when you're working with the site. Um, set the spectrum analyzer frequency to zero hertz. Frequency span, sorry, the span is zero hertz. We're, we're going to stay on one frequency with the spectrum analyzer. So we're going to work the analyzer in the time domain. Set the sweep time to, to say, 30 seconds for starters. Because r radars are going to take 2, 4, 5, 10, 12 seconds to come around. We want to look at this for a while. So make it 30 seconds for starters. And set your sweep mode on the analyzer to the single mode. Now, record the beam scanning behavior in time with a 30 second sweep. So what you're going to see is going to look something like this. As the sweep is moving like this at the single frequency tune to the radar's emissions in that earth station uh, where you're sitting, you're going to see something like this. If, if this is the noise level of the earth station receiver itself down here, here's what you're going to see. And down and like that. You're seeing the behavior of the radar scanning in time and these are some sketches I did so that we wouldn't have to deal with data release problems for particular radars. Here's time in milliseconds, 10, 20, 30. I carry these pictures in my head and what we see here are um, a set of individual pulses that form a little lobe, then a big lobe, then back down. If we record this and we take the highest amplitude pulse and then we come out and we drop 3 dB down and then come across here to the same amplitude point over on this side, we have the 3 dB point of that antenna beam pattern. And we count up the pulses in here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 pulses between the 3 dB points. Bingo! Radar. This is where the radar is detecting its targets. These are the side lobes of the radar scanning. Uh, classic. I, I mean, this is exactly what you'll see. And you'll see this occur every time the radar comes around and looks at you. That's why you set it to single shot mode. You just want one scan with the spectrum analyzer, one sweep with the analyzer that shows one set of those pulses one time as the radar scans past your location. So, um, if the radar beam is maximizing at regular periodic intervals, 2, 4, 5, 10, 12 seconds, then it's a simple mechanical rotation. That's like number 3 and number 7 on that slide earlier, slide number 12. 
Um, remember that the beam scanning interval of the radar is just the time between the successive peaks. The longer the rotation interval, obviously the longer the radar's range. If you see a sub-variation in time superimposed on a regular rotation, then it may be doing elevation beam scanning. That's like that number 5 on slide 12. If you're getting a time interval between the main peaks that alternates between short and long, we already talked about that, sector scanning. And if you see what seems like a um, very or totally irregular scanning pattern, then it's probably an electronically steered beam, which means it's some kind of a phased array radar, like, for example, a pave pause type radar. Not that it would be pave pause, but it could be that type of radar. So here, here we're looking from zero to five seconds. This is a long time. The receiver has, the, the air station receiver has noise right here. So this thing comes up out of the noise, we see the side lobes, we see it come out like that and down. Now, in here, right in that main beam, that's where you have those 15 pulses. But if you're running a long time, here, zero to five seconds, you're not going to see the individual pulses anymore. You'll see just this envelope, and you're seeing this beam scanning going on. And you may well see a blurp in the middle that is 10, well, hopefully more than 10, more like 20, 30, 40 dB down. That's the back lobe of the radar antenna. That's his back lobe. It's not, it, there's nothing exotic. That's just, it's, it's, that's the imperfection of the radar antenna. So you see two peaks occur five seconds apart, five second rotation time, nothing else complicated going on, two dimensional beam scanning like for an air traffic control radar. Doesn't necessarily mean it is an air traffic control, but that would be consistent with what you're seeing. Now, suppose you see this. You see a much more broken up looking pattern. You still see it repeating every so often. In fact, it's repeating every 10 seconds. 10, 20, 30. You see side lobes in here, but you also see, see this, this more broken up characteristic. That's what you see with an electronic elevation scanning that's being done electronically while it rotates. It's going bloop, 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 while it's rotating around slowly in time every 10 seconds it's scanning three-dimensionally, it's scanning that third dimension with electronic beam steering and this is this is the kind of characteristic that you'll see on an electronic beam uh, steering uh, uh, beam scanning, elevation scanning radar. Now you might see something like that, a pair of peaks and I intentionally have drawn these non-symmetrically Okay, so you take the interval from the left to the left, or from the one on the right to the one on the right, any way you want to do it. You get 3.8 seconds, but you're seeing pairs. Sector scanning going on. And you know the sector scanning interval here is 3.8 seconds. Now, something that looks fairly irregular. We get some big peaks. There's one big peak. It does some irregular stuff. Here's a big peak 12 seconds later. There's another peak, but it's not 12 seconds after that, which would be at 24. It's a little further. It's more like 26. Hmm. And then another one that's a little shorter. Oh, 34 and so forth. But on the average, how often are we getting a big burst here? On the average, every 12 seconds. Ah! Air search radar, fully electronically beam steered. They don't ever wait too long before they come back and look at, uh, come back and look at you. And this one might be frequency hopping because sometimes when it looks at us, it's tuned a little off frequency, and the amplitude response is 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 down a little bit. Ah, electronic beam steering, maybe frequency hopping, fully three-dimensional air search radar probably. So I talk here about how to how to interpret it, and I've already said it really in words. Simple mechanical rotation. Uh, means you're getting a simple air search radar, two-dimensional. Elevation beam scanning means three-dimensional radar, range azimuth, and elevation information, but still just doing searching. Sector scanning is probably going to be an airborne radar, could be doing search, could be doing mapping, could be doing weather surveillance, could be a fire control system, could be a combination of all the above in a multi-mode. Um, depending upon what you can record and look at, you might be able to sort that out in somewhat more detail. If the radar is doing fully electronic uh, uh, phased array beam steering, then, well, that's what you're seeing is an advanced three-dimensional search system and probably a system that could track as well as search. These other radars typically, except for the sector scanning airborne, can't track. Well, they do track, but they don't track with the beam. They track with logic in, inside the receiver processing. This could do, like, this kind of system can do real-time tracking where it actually puts a beam boom, 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 boom boom, and it follows a target along while it's doing its other scanning. So, uh, the radar emission spectrum, to do that, uh, set your resolution bandwidth equal to or less than one of the pulse width. 
and then look at that spectrum through that satellite receiver and you'll see what you, you'll see what you see remember on that earlier slide that we looked at we saw what looked like a magnetron hump over on the side mm -hmm. that one well that was a magnetron hump over on the left side so if it's got a single peak then it's oh and this is important if you see a single peak right there in the satellite receiver which for example we saw on the example uh, way back uh, uh, about uh, 20 minutes ago then there's a good chance that they simply mistuned it up into the satellite pan if you or it's a really 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 high spur in the out of band or spurious emission part of the spectrum if on the other hand you see an emission that looks really flat across the uh, uh, satellite receiver IF then you might be looking at an, at an unwanted emission or you could be looking at a chirp pulse system again that's just been mistuned um, that is an FM system um, but it's also possible, as I say, that if it looks flat across the satellite receiver, that um, you may just be seeing radar unwanted emissions out there. Front end overload, we've talked about this in earlier talks, we, so by now this is a classic. If you see this happening after every radar pulse, while you're making measurements at the Earth station, you see where this is the Earth station's receiver noise level, and you see a dip after every radar pulse, dip, 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 dip after every radar pulse, that's front end overload, got to put a filter on the front end of the Earth station. And if that doesn't solve it, then you've got some exotic problem like I talked about on my last talk in which the, um, in which the uh, um, radar, in which the Earth Station receiver has some kind of exotic problem like a detector in front of a bandpass filter. So now put it all together. Combine the pulse repetition interval or, pulse, or equivalent to pulse rep rate measurement that you've got with the pulse width, with the beam scanning technique, with whatever information you've got about tube type versus solid state, remember you can get that from the duty cycle, and whatever spectrum data have been obtained. And once you've put all that together, the first thing that you can do, the first thing you can do is eliminate most radar types. Most radar types won't have that particular rep interval, pulse width, beam scanning technique, transmitter type, and possibly whatever spectrum you've got. They won't, okay? The very fact that you can eliminate most radar types means that now you've narrowed your candidate list down to hopefully one or a few radar types. Some useful public, um, some useful publicly available references are Jane's Radar and Electronic Warfare Systems and Jane's Weapon Systems. These books cost you, they will cost you 200 to maybe $300 US but um, money well spent if you're, if you're looking for characteristics because they typically put as much information as they can find in the open literature about radars into these books. Now, it is, it, it is or would be possible to use a precise time-based correlation between multiple satellites to perform long baseline interferometry and isolate the location of radar transmitters right on the Earth's surface. Now, doing that, although it's technically feasible, um, relies on administrative arrangements between geosynchronous satellite operators. The basic idea is this. If this is the Earth's surface down here, here's the curve of the Earth's surface down here, we've got a satellite here, satellite here, satellite here, satellite here, in geosync. You've got a radar down here in the Earth's surface, and that radar is spinning around like that, and as it spins around, it hits that satellite, then 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 that satellite. Then that satellite. If you can correlate the satellite uh, received signals in time with a very precise time base, then you can isolate the location on your surface where that signal must be originating. And as I say, that's a long baseline interferometry technique. Radio astronomers do it for, for sources uh, long distances from the Earth, and um, you know you can do it with the satellites if you can put together the administrative arrangements and get the, and get the time based correlation going. So, for more information on um, RF front end overload and other problems with uh, fixed satellite Earth stations, go to uh, NTA Report 94-313. Information on radar emissions and how to measure them. More information available in this report, 05-420, how to measure for RSEC compliance. It also gives you most of the information I presented here today about measuring the emissions in the geostationary satellite links. And uh, that's it for the talk itself. Uh, any questions? All right. Thanks for coming, and I will see you, as it were, in the next talk.